Welcome to today's core training on refining program outcomes and evaluation tools with an equity lens. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your hosts and trainers today. As you can hear, our Core Institute events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, thanks to our team members, Stella Lauerman, who provides simultaneous interpretation and translates all of our core materials, and Gisela Carrasco, who's providing consecutive interpretation right now, and will also translate your comments and questions in the chat. And then I'll turn it over to Nicole Young. So today's training is going to focus a lot on how to kind of create your building blocks for an evaluation, uh, including things like your outcomes. And so we know that there can be all kinds of feelings about evaluation itself. And so we're gonna launch a little poll just to get us started to see what does the word evaluation make you feel? Does it make you feel happy and excited, uh, intrigued and curious, very sleepy, a little nervous, apprehensive, or some other word that we haven't included here? We'll give you a moment to think about that and select your answer, and then we'll share the results to see what the feeling is in the virtual room here today. I see a few more responses coming in. We'll give it about maybe 10 more seconds before I close it. Okay. I think we have all of our responses. So I'm gonna end this and share the results. And we can see we've got um, a little bit of everything here. So a lot of responses about intrigued and curious. So that's great. It's great that you're here. And um, <clears throat> some of you <laughs> will do our best to keep you awake uh, since evaluation makes you feel a little sleepy and, and we'll try to make this engaging and approachable and usable so that those of you that are feeling a little nervous, hopefully leave here feeling less nervous. So thanks for that. That um, again, helps us just to know uh, who, who we're talking to and her, who we're working with today. So let's go over what we're going to cover uh, for our agenda today. So we'll do as usual, a little overview of core investments and then we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about measuring change. And so we have a couple concepts to review. Uh, one is the equitable evaluation framework. And then we'll do a quick refresher about how to develop short and intermediate term outcomes. And then we'll add to that how you then do that with an equity lens throughout or how you can, um, what kinds of questions you can be asking yourself to go back and do kind of an equity check. And then we'll finish with sharing some additional equity-centered evaluation tips and tools. Um, so we don't you know, expect, or we're not, we don't want you to think, oh, I have to somehow use all of this information or all of these tools in my core application. Think of this as just more information and tools to add to your toolbox and when it feels appropriate, when it feels relevant, when it feels like it would be adding, adding value, adding um, quality to your proposal to draw on these kinds of tools. So we will leave time at the end for questions and then talk about uh, next steps and additional training and technical assistance opportunities. Next slide. So in our trainings, we like to do our best to create a brave and inclusive learning space. So we really want people to feel like it's okay to ask questions, to not know all the answers, um, to feel some of that discomfort or apprehension or nervousness and use that energy to learn. And so we just encourage everyone to <clears throat> share, the, share the air today. Excuse me, hold on just a second. Um, so both you know, verbally and in the chat, just being mindful of um, how much time you're using or taking to add your comments, ask your questions, and we're just gonna do our best to make sure everyone has that opportunity to share. Um, that we, as part of the learning, want to lean into discomfort so we can take risks, um, definitely draw on our own experiences and just know that everyone has different experiences and preferences and opinions about evaluation, about equity, about core. 
So we want to make sure that we're listening fully to each other and being present. <clears throat> it helps us stay curious so we can call each other into the learning instead of calling each other out. Um, and along with that, we try to separate in intent from impact. And so uh, if someone says something or reacts or asks a question or shares a perspective in a way that um, feels off-putting or even uh, offensive that we just try to remember as part of the learning process that that may not have been the intent, but we can explain what the impact is and learn from it. We do ask everyone to honor confidentiality, especially if you uh, are hearing things. Sometimes people share in these trainings either um, some challenges or struggles they're trying to work through in their own organizations. Some of you might end up sharing certain things about your where you are in your core application process. Um, these trainings are being recorded and shared. And so just for you, just, uh, just know that so you can choose what you want to say out loud on the recording. But then also, uh, if you're hearing uh, someone share something, to just remember that that's their, their story, their experience to share, um, not ours. And last but not least, we encourage everyone to practice self-care throughout the session. We are spending a good chunk of time together today, three hours. Um, so we're glad you're all here. We will build in a break and encourage you to take care of yourself throughout the session if it's not a dedicated break time. Um, and I uh, hope that we all enjoy our time together. So how, let me just do a quick check. How do those sound as group agreements? Can everyone agree to those and help each other follow those, help us uh, help the group follow those as well? Just scroll through the video tiles. I see clapping hands. Thank you, Peggy. Thumbs up. Thank you, Liz. Okay, so we're gonna consider these our group agreements and appreciate everyone helping us um, follow those. Okay, so here's our quick overview of CORE. Again, I know some of you are really familiar with this. Others of you might be participating in a CORE training for the first time. So we wanna make sure everyone has the same uh, context, same information about CORE, which stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we describe it as both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And CORE has this mission and vision that you'll see on the next slide with equity, and well-being and resilience uh, very much front and center in our mission and vision. So that really becomes like our both our anchor and our guiding star. And when we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan need to have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent, interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. Um, and so, you know, we want to get to a place where we see that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, gender, income level, gender identity, and so on, uh, and so on, um, that we want to, again, um, see that everyone has equal opportunities to experience health and well-being. And you'll see that equity is at the center of this diagram. And so we constantly talk about centering equity um, as a way to just remind ourselves that we have to examine and address our individual and our organizational and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that might be perpetuating the very inequities that we're trying to eliminate. And so that's a lot of what we'll be talking about today is like, how do we ask the kinds of questions and do the kind of reflection that helps us identify where uh, we can create those equitable conditions. On the next slide, you'll see that in the core request for proposals or RFP, equity is also really central uh, to the RFP. So it uses phrases like um, identifying populations within the county who may face particular obstacles to health and well-being, creating solutions tied to their needs, addressing root causes of inequity, the next slide, and this is a really key concept that you'll hear us referring to throughout today's training, that equity is both a process, it's how we do things, including how we do program planning, how we do evaluation, how we deliver services, 
Um, and it's also the desired impact. So when we think about outcomes, we wanna be seeing that equity is increased or disparities are, de are decreased. Um, and so we focus on anti-racism and racial ex equity explicitly, but not exclusively. So we acknowledge that there are multiple dimensions of equity is often the term we use. You'll see some of those listed on the next slide. Again, things like race, ethnicity, zip code, immigration status, language, and other characteristics. So we wanted to start with that reminder just to make sure that there's, again, some shared language about what we mean by equity as we talk about how to develop program outcomes and evaluation tools with an equity lens. And today's training, if you go to the next slide, today's training and all the other office hours and technical assistance sessions and things like the core coffee chats that some of you are familiar with, all of this we provide through the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. Um, so think of the Core Institute as this umbrella or container for a variety of training and technical assistance opportunities, other learning opportunities um, to really build some shared knowledge and skills in areas like programs and practices, data and evaluation, infrastructure and sustainability and policy and systems change. Um, so we, you know, in the last couple of months and through this month in January, we'll be focusing very heavily on providing training and technical assistance, specifically focused on helping people prepare their core applications for funding. After January is over, then we'll resume some of our other learning opportunities like coffee chats that cover different topics. Um, probably fit in a break there after this intense month of training in TA, but if you uh, are just joining us for a core institute event for the first time today, um, we'll, we'll be adding you to our email list so you can hear about additional opportunities coming up. And again, if you have <clears throat> specific questions about the request for proposals, about the application itself, um, about how to use the online platform reviewer for submitting your application, all of those kinds of questions are best to send directly to the county email address, corefunding at santacruzcounty.us. Uh, so if the county can answer those and include those in their next posting of questions responses uh, on January 20th. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it back to Nicole to talk about the equitable evaluation framework overview. Thanks, Nicole. I'm going to give you a quick overview and we're gonna to return to many of the things I'm gonna mention at the end of our session today in more detail, but this is sort of setting the stage for that discussion. And we thought we'd start with a little bit of um, evaluation humor. Yes, there is such a thing. So here we have somebody asking, what kind of evaluation did you need? And the, the person's answering, well, our three-year project is coming to the end and we were told we needed an evaluation. What kind is that? So I actually had the misfortune of working in exactly this situation and I do not recommend it at all. So today we hope we'll give you some insights and tools and tips that will help you think about evaluation questions and methods and results upfront with an equity lens. But the good news is that whether you're new to evaluation or have already participated in them, the existing core tools are relevant in so many ways and can really help. So we will do our best to, to share that now. You may have heard the term equitable evaluation and we hope to help you um, understand that better through today's session, but really it's a shift in evaluation practice in several different dimensions. We in CORE always think about evaluation as an opportunity to learn. So that's the spirit behind today's training and in fact, behind all our Core Institute training. It can take a lot of different forms, but that's the basic idea. What do we wanna know? Why do we wanna know that? How do we learn about what we wanna know? So what, what are the tools and instruments that we can use? There are many, many, many approaches to evaluation that depend on the scope, the complexity, et cetera, of what you're trying to evaluate. So, um, there are different types of evaluations that might be a better fit for some uh, types of questions than others. So we're not gonna get into that so much today, but just try to really think about these shifts in terms of what we ask. So 
in general, evaluations pose questions about a program, a policy, a practice. Does it work as intended? What can we learn about how and why it works? Is it reaching the people it's designed to reach? Is it achieving the outcomes that we hoped it would? If so, what is driving that? But if not, what could be improved or do the outcomes themselves need to be changed? Did we achieve something that maybe we didn't anticipate? So in, in the spirit of learning and evaluation, things that don't work out are just as interesting and useful as things that do work out the way we intended. So we hope to get that across as well. And to answer those kinds of questions, we have to use different methods. So we may be just observing what's happening and keeping some kind of record of that. We may do some interviews or surveys of the people who are participating in our program. We may try and do something before and after, pre and post an intervention to see whether anything changed or whether anyone's actually better off. Maybe we use some of that information to develop more in-depth case studies that illustrate what's happening, provide some data on who participates and how they participate. Maybe we have administrative data, just like who's eligible for something, who enrolls in it and who doesn't. Maybe even some comparisons with a group or a place that's participating in a program compared to a group or a place that isn't. And some of the methods might involve more qualitative sorts of data like stories or interviews, and some might be more quantitative with counting and numbers and statistics. And to do all that work, an evaluation involves a team of people. Um, sometimes it's a solo person, but often it's multiple people working on these types of tasks. Sometimes it's an outside evaluator or a person or firm, but there usually is an internal team that you're working with, even if they don't call themselves an evaluation team. And a mix of both external and internal people is very common as well. So someone or several someones is posing and refining these kinds of questions, designing data collection tools and strategies, analyzing data and sharing the results. And then once you have all that in hand or through the process of having all of that information, someone or someone's again, the evaluation team or a broader group is trying to make sense of what you're finding, what the results are. What does it all mean? What needs to change? What could we do differently in the future? What did we learn and what else do we want to know? And who else needs to know what we're learning? So equitable evaluation is really shifting those to ask different questions. And one way to think about equitable evaluation is that it just pushes us to do that, to ask different and we would argue better questions about our work. Like other applications of an equity lens, these questions get us closer to an understanding of root causes, systems and structures so that we have more opportunities to address them instead of looking aside or averting our gaze from those. So some of the questions that we will ex be exploring in more detail later on this morning are in the category of evaluating the evaluators. And we might wanna talk about for starters, who is it who's defining success for a program? What kind of uh, markers are they using and are those the ones that are appropriate for what we're trying to understand? Who's being evaluated and who isn't? Who's the primary user of evaluation findings? Who are the evaluators and the, the experts? What counts as evidence? What's the role of trust and relationships in our evaluation work? An equitable evaluation approach brings these questions front and center because for too long, they were not asked at all and therefore not considered or answered. And then there are also some equitable evaluation principles. These happen to be from the Equitable Evaluation Initiative. Gisela is going to put a link to that in the chat if you'd like to um, download some more details from that initiative. There are lots of resources at this link. It's a great place to start if you're curious about some of the information we're sharing in today's training and want to go into more depth on it. The Equitable Evaluation Initiative, you see the logo here at the top of this slide, 
has its roots in philanthropic funding. So it's, it's geared to foundations and is actually supported by some major national foundations. So that may or may not be applicable to all the kinds of funders and evaluations we're thinking about, but these principles give us a lot of food for thought. So the first one is that evaluation and evaluative work should be in the service of advancing equity. The second principle is that evaluative work should be designed and implemented to be commensurate with the values that underlie equity work. So, for example, the evaluation should be valid for different cultures, not just one. Participants, people with lived experience, should have a say in what's measured and shared or could be considered owners of the data that they're, they're offering. Um, sometimes you hear that captured by the phrase, nothing about us without us. So if you get into the equitable evaluation literature, you'll see that a lot. And the third principle from the Equitable Evaluation Initiative is that evaluative work can and should answer critical questions about historical, structural, and systemic drivers of inequity. So for example, an evaluation of a school district's graduation rates that somehow did not address differences in staffing or per pupil spending or other structural and systemic factors that are relevant to a graduation rate would not be advancing equity and would not be taking those systemic and structural factors into account and therefore would not be giving a comprehensive view of why those results are happening. So any questions about what we've presented so far? So feel free to raise a question in the chat or raise your hand. Beth, go ahead. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm um, with Eat for the Earth and we're planning two, two different uh, proposals. And one of them has to do with the, um, the outcome that we're going toward is healthy environments. And so I'm just wondering, um, that, that that's the one that this is coming up the most for me, um, how this, and it might be later in the training that I'll understand it better, but how does this equity lens apply when the environment, you know, when, when, you know, I understand that different people are impacted differently by different environments, but particularly our issue is supporting people to um, eat in a way that is better for the environment. Um, so I, I'm having a hard time imagining how the equity lens would apply to that. Um, the health one is a lot easier. The other one is about health. And so can you say a little bit more about what you see as the obstacles to eating that way? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, access to healthy food, you know, where people live, what their incomes are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that part is really easy, but how to design something with an equity lens when we want, when the, when the needed outcome is for everybody to shift their diet in a certain direction in order to preserve the habitability of the earth. Um, we can certainly, we can certainly create a, a program that mostly works in lower income areas or areas where they don't have access to healthy foods. Um, but I, you, you see what I'm getting at? Maybe it's, maybe I'm making a bigger problem than it is. That, yeah, I, that I it, think, go ahead. We, we can't put the problem on those people. You know, it's right, like the, right, the right. problem. In fact, those people are probably eating less of the foods that are harmful to the environment than the people who are eating more of the foods because they're more expensive. You know, if you're eating a lot of steaks and, you know, dairy and things like that, that's a lot more money and um, costs a lot more money. And so, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to focus on the population that's most impacted to do the intervention at the exclusion of the population that's creating the impact. Mm -hmm. So a couple thoughts, and some of these might be more appropriate for a one-on-one -on -one TA session related to the specific issues in your proposal, but just generally, Embedded in your question, Beth, are a lot of things about um, the kinds of things we're talking about. So, so you asked, you said you didn't want to put the burden on the people who are most affected by the problem with coming up with solutions. But you're also looking at some of the, the systems at play. So where are healthy foods available? What are some of the structures that make that easier or harder for people to access? What are the kinds of things that might change that landscape? 
we a few weeks ago, or maybe it was a couple months ago at this point, we also did a training on something called targeted universalism that has to do with this interplay of how do you address the greatest need while also lifting up some some universal uh, change around that. So that there, so I'm just saying that because it's not mutually exclusive to say that we're focusing on a population that has a particular need. Um, as, as well as a broader population, because ultimately some of these changes do apply, as, as, as you're describing, to everyone to some degree. And it's a question of where you're focusing effort and where you're focusing um, responsibilities for change and possibilities for change. So I, I understand your concern about, about the burden, um, but I think there's some different ways to think about that as well. Um, I'm going to suggest, Nicole, um, I, if we keep going, I think, Beth, maybe some of the concepts and tools that we'll review over the next um, segment might also help. And so then we can circle back to your question if after all of this, you're, you're still feeling like, no, nope, that still didn't quite get at it. But I think some of the things that you're raising are the things that we'll cover next. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and but do let us know if you still have questions after these next couple segments. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So Nicole, I think I'll turn it back over to you. Would you like me to keep advancing slides? Sure. Okay. Um, so our next... Uh, piece that we're going to cover here is about how to then refine your short-term and intermediate-term outcomes with an equity lens. And so depending on where you are with your core application, if you're just starting to work on your application, you haven't drafted or developed your outcomes yet, this might help you think about how to go about doing that. If you've already started working on your application, think of this as a way to almost like a little checklist, okay, as I <laughs> develop my outcomes, did I take these kinds of things into consideration? You might even go back and look at your outcomes and, and hopefully some of you have that with you um, so you can kind of take a look at it in real time to see, oh, is there anything that could be refined um, to make that focus on, on equity more explicit? Next slide. So again, all, you know, as Nicole mentioned a moment ago, we have done a number of other previous trainings and coffee chats on several of these concepts, like targeted universalism, developing a theory of change, developing a logic model. Um, and so Gisela is gonna put another link in the chat uh, where you can find all of those videos of previous trainings and events on the Core Investments YouTube channel. And so if you missed one of those and, and we're not going in enough depth today on a concept, uh, you can check out those videos. And so just as a brief refresher, um, some of you might recall if you attended our training earlier, you know, we recommend going through an exercise like developing a theory of change, even if it's not a requirement in a grant application, it really can help structure, clarify some of the thinking, it provides an opportunity, especially if you are developing an application as a group or doing program planning or creating an evaluation plan with a group of coworkers, community members, other partners, going through an exercise like developing a theory of change and a logic model can really help flush out some of those um, ideas, assumptions, things that are helpful to clarify before you start implementing and evaluating. So in a theory of change, you might remember that there are kind of three basic pieces to it. You're identifying you know, what we call a problem or a, a, an area of concern or an area of need or something that where there's a clear inequity or difference in well-being that shouldn't exist. So that's what we mean by problem. Um, so a description of what that problem or need is, and then the context, meaning a description about, you know, your assumptions about, about why that problem exists, what are the root causes, um, so that you're doing that kind of thinking before you start proposing or developing solutions. So you're really thinking through like, what is the appropriate or effective solution to address that problem, close that 
equity gap, um, and so on. And so if you are doing a theory of change and you wanna think about how to apply an equity lens to that process, some ways to do that are as you're developing and identifying the problem or need statement, that you're using a variety of data and stories to help illustrate what that uh, current situation is, who's experiencing it, who might be affected more by the particular inequities or gaps. Um, so again, that might be a combination of quantitative data, so the numbers, as well as qualitative data, anecdotes, stories, case studies, things like that. You can also then, as you're uh, thinking about and articulating the context, right? You're looking at, again, not just the visible um, symptoms or concerning outcomes or disparities in the data, but you're really digging deeper to look at, well, what's actually causing that? What's at the root of it? Um, many times it is those systemic barriers uh, that, and actually Beth, this is, I think what you were describing in your question, right? That it might be a particular um, program or practice or policy that is uh, causing or contributing to the concerning um, problems or disparities or needs that you're seeing in the data. So really articulating what those root causes and systemic barriers are is a way to apply an equity lens to a theory of change. And then when you're looking at solutions, this then helps you make sure that, you know, the, your hypotheses about what approaches, what services, what practices, what policy changes are going to be effective, that you're doing that uh, through a lens of looking at, okay, what's, what's culturally responsive? This is where targeted universalism um, might come into play, where you're, where you're acknowledging that um, everybody could benefit, right? The health and well-being of everybody could be lifted or improved. And also we wanna make sure that these solutions will directly address or help mitigate those, those gaps, the inequities, the problem that was identified in the first place. So again, you'll see that kind of this recurring theme throughout a theory of change to be asking what data do you have or you need to support your theory of change? And does that data really um, illuminate the needs, the context, the, the solutions uh, through an equity lens? So that was a theory of change. And then a logic model, you might remember, is just another tool that, again, uh, isn't always required in grant applications, but we, you know, we highly suggest and recommend going through that as a thought exercise anytime you're doing program planning or evaluation planning, because it's your chance to articulate what you're doing uh, in addition to why. So the kind of basic building blocks of a logic model are uh, kind of a series of if-then statements. So if we have these resources or inputs to do these activities or participants, that's sometimes called outputs, then we would expect or want or hope to see these short-term, intermediate, or long-term changes. And again, on the next slide, you'll see if as you're developing your logic model, you want to do kind of that equity check then some of the specific questions you might be asking yourself as you're going through this process, when you're thinking about inputs, you might be asking yourself, not just what resources do we need or do we have, but what do we have or need to increase equity? So if you're tying it back to the problem or need statement and the context and your solutions and your theory of change, then you're asking yourself, okay, in order to do that and to, um, you know, help address or prevent or close that, that gap or, or close that, those inequities, what resources do we have or do we need? It might mean things like having bilingual, bicultural staff, bilingual evaluation tools, maybe uh, involving participants as co-designers of your programs and your evaluation. And so some of these things might seem really obvious. Maybe they're things you're already doing, you already have in place for others. These might be new questions that you're asking yourselves or your partners and your colleagues. These are important questions to be asking in terms of your inputs because they might have implications for your budget that you wanna then be thinking about how do you make sure you're building in resources to implement solutions that get you closer to equity um, versus, you know, often, you know, we can find ourselves in that situation where we've promised something and then we find out, oh, we didn't actually 
budget the resources to do that. So now we're in this impossible, yeah, impossible bind. So those are some questions that you could ask to apply an equity lens in that step of your logic model, in terms of your outputs or activities, you know, asking who are the participants, um, you know, and thinking about are, you know, how will you or how you how will you be explicit about reaching, engaging, involving the groups of people who are most impacted by the problem or need that you identified, the inequities, um, and involving them, you know, whenever possible and, and however it's feasible. And again, um, at the very least, providing input about what you're proposing to offer, at, uh, possibly even being the co-designers, right? Or kind of sharing in that ownership of the solutions. And then thinking about, you know, what activities or strategies are needed to address the problem and increase equity. And I'll show you a tool in a moment, one of our core tools that can help with that. And then finally, and when it comes to the outcomes, again, applying an equity lens, you know, really continuously asking what results would you be looking for? Would you want to be measuring that will tell you whether the activities or strategies you've chosen are increasing equitable health and well-being? So those are just some, again, uh, very brief tips and suggestions about kind of questions, how to apply some of those concepts that Nicole is describing in the equitable evaluation framework, like as you're developing a theory of change and logic model. I'm gonna switch over now. And so Nicole, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and show one of the core tools that we've again covered in previous trainings. So this will just be a quick highlight, quick review. Gisela has posted the link in the, in the chat. So we encourage you to explore it some more. And I'm realizing I think I am in the Spanish version. <laughs> so uh, just so you know, you can uh, view this in different languages, but today we'll, sh we'll look at it in English. So this is what we call the strategies and program outcomes menu. The link to it, you can actually get to it um, from the core results menu page, which you find under local progress pages on data share. So this is a tool that we developed as part of core and we have embedded it or housed it within data share, this um, data platform because it felt so natural and such a good fit to be able to link this concept of these core conditions of well-being with actual community level indicators and impacts. So again, this is where you'll um, find that strategies and program outcomes menu. And the idea behind this tool is again, it's meant to be flexible, that you treat it like an a la carte menu, you <laughs> look at it and decide what of it feels applicable and useful and relevant to you. Um, but this is where, you know, if you're thinking through in your theory of change and then your logic model, what strategies, meaning broad categories of activities, uh, do you think are needed to address the problem or need that you've identified that will get you to desired program outcomes, that this can help you think through where are you focusing your efforts? Are you focusing them on people who are experiencing the inequities, people who might benefit from the programs or policies or projects that you're offering? So some examples might be, you know, that we've listed here, women experiencing homelessness, seniors who are homebound, undocumented immigrants or mixed status families. So in, your, in the way that you're describing or understanding the people or population or group you're working with, right? That's one opportunity to um, be descriptive so that it's clear like who, who is again, experiencing the gap or the need, the challenge, the inequities. And then some strategies, right? That might um, help address, again, the disparity or the challenge you've identified so we just listed some examples here. Certainly you might think of others as well, but the idea is here is this might give you some helpful sample language to use in your grant applications. So you'll see we have people listed here in terms of where you might be focusing your efforts. And we also have things like organizations and systems. 
Maybe it's the change needs to happen within your own or other organizations that are uh, either the ones facilitating that access or creating barriers to access, you know, inadvertently, right? To um, that then are causing or contributing to the kinds of challenges and inequities that you're seeing. Other strategies in terms of where you might be focusing your efforts might be places and communities where people live, work, and play. So again, this is where if you're noticing <clears throat> particular differences, disparities, inequities based on geographic area or geographic characteristics, right, then your solutions, your strategies, your activities might be focused on um, particular places and communities. The activities themselves might be about how you know, you're reaching, engaging, and engaging with community members, how you're organizing and building power. It might be you know, actual policy change and systems change um, to change the conditions for health and well-being. And then this last category here, um, in terms of where you might be focusing your efforts, you may be building the public and political will uh, among people who can influence or make changes in policies and investments. So influence through serving on leadership committees or advisory committees or being you know, elected to positions or voting uh, on issues. And so lots of ways to think about this. And so we wanted to, in this menu, include all these examples so that, you know, just as you were saying earlier about sometimes the, there are programs and uh, services that are best delivered directly to people and you wanna be able to articulate that and have outcomes that uh, are related to that. Sometimes your efforts might be focused at, a, at an organizational or systems level in order to make those services, those programs, uh, those projects accessible. Uh, to people. So that is one suggestion there in terms of how you might use a tool like this. And again, thinking about with an equity lens, like what is, what is the strategy that's needed to close that equity gap? And then again, this, in this same tool here, we've listed examples of how to phrase program outcomes. And so We've broken it down by short-term outcomes, which are usually the thing that changes that happen first, right? Usually a change in awareness happens first, like someone becomes aware of something, then deepens or builds knowledge about it. That can lead to changes in attitudes or beliefs about an issue or about themselves, um, which creates readiness to, to build or change skills. Those kinds of changes usually have to happen first before you start to see measurable, sustainable changes in behaviors and status. So status, we mean health status, economic status, housing status, safety status, uh, things like that. So again, we've listed some examples here. So if you are just starting out drafting your core application or you haven't gotten as far as <clears throat> developing your outcomes, these phrases might give you some helpful starting points or customizable sample phrases that you can tailor and modify to make it fit uh, what you are proposing. A couple things I want to point out here, and you'll notice um, in the way that we've phrased this, and I think I'm actually going to switch back to the slides because I think it might be easier to see. So I think Nicole, I will, I can go ahead and I'll share my own screen at this point. Okay. <clears throat> so what I'm showing here are just a few of the examples that were on that website in terms of kind of how to structure program outcomes that for your core applications, we recommend using a format like this where you're, um, you're specifying some kind of a percent change, whether it's an increase or decrease in something 
that's that you're <laughs> saying will happen either a change in awareness or knowledge or attitudes and beliefs or a skill um, and so if you're for example proposing to deliver a program or some kind of a service that's intended to increase awareness about um uh, about the importance of healthy eating let's just use for example that you that you would want to be able to say as part of your outcome statements that you're proposing to measure and demonstrate a certain percent increase in awareness of the issue healthy eating among and this is where you would fill in however you describe the group that you would be working with or delivering the service to so everywhere where you see something in brackets, that's meant to be like a placeholder where you can then insert the language that's, a, that's relevant to your proposal. I would also <clears throat> suggest in your core applications, we don't have it here, but uh, um, probably a good idea to add it in your core applications that when you're describing your outcomes in your application, that you add at the end of this as measured by, and then you describe what tool you're going to use. So a percent increase. So let's say, you know, just making up these numbers, 20% increase in awareness of healthy eating options among youth ages 13 to 16, comma, as measured by, and I'm just making up this name, a healthy eating uh, survey. So whatever that tool is that you're going to use to measure awareness about the issue, name it because that will help, again, help the reviewers, help the funders understand like how it is you're planning to measure your outcome. And so again, some more examples here in terms of the intermediate outcomes. And you know, if you are finding that you are just again getting started, or you're not really sure, you know, which outcomes are best to use, um, sometimes what we'll suggest is like build out a whole results chain, um, because then you can decide okay, what are the outcomes. At what point um, is it feasible? Is it meaningful to be measuring the change that's happening? So, meaning that you might. Um, come up with an outcome for the change in awareness that you hope would happen as a result of whatever it is you're proposing to do. What's that change in awareness? What's that change in knowledge? What's the change in attitudes and beliefs? What's the change in skills that might happen? What are the change in behaviors? And what's the change in status? And so it doesn't mean that you would have to be um, including all those outcomes or committing to measuring all those outcomes in your actual grant proposal. But this kind of process, like building out the whole results chain might help you then decide, especially if you're <clears throat> doing this exercise uh, as a group with others, to then decide, oh, this really is where it would be meaningful to measure change. Or ultimately we would hope to see a, and be able to measure and demonstrate a change in status health status, economic status as a result of our services. But you know, our program doesn't have the capacity to do that kind of measurement, but what we could measure is, is a change that happens earlier in this chain. And so that's just one suggested tool that might help you. And so we wanted to give you a chance to, to try this out for yourselves. And again, if you've already drafted your outcomes uh, feel free to take a look at those and see, is there anything you would change about those? If you haven't yet drafted outcomes for your core application, this would be a good chance to give it a try. And so we want to give you about, um, we're going to give you about six minutes to try to develop at least one or two short-term or intermediate outcomes for the program that you are or at least one of the programs that you're applying for core funding for. So we'll give you some time to just do that. Grab a piece of paper, or if you have a document open, you want to type on that. Um, take a few moments, and we'll just I'll keep the screen share up here. And we'll, um, and if you 
find it helpful to have the uh, strategies and program outcomes menu that I was showing on data share. If you find that helpful to have that open also, you might want to have that available so you can look at it with and find those sample outcome phrases. So we'll give you about now about five minutes to do a little bit of individual work and then we'll see if anyone is, would be willing to share something. So I'm going to go on mute now. And while you're working, I see a couple of questions and um, requests coming through in the chat. One was sent as a private message, but I think it might be <clears throat> helpful for others to hear as well. So the question is, can one activity have several outcomes, meaning a change in awareness and a change in behavior? And yes. Um, <laughs> and that question was actually meant to be shared with everyone. So I'm glad I'm saying it out loud. Um, so yes, one activity could have several outcomes. That's part of um, the potential value of, of doing a results chain. So you can see and think about, okay, could that activity or service that you're proposing actually result in some kind of change in behavior? If yes, what would that be? And do you have a way of measuring that? Um, sometimes with particular activities or services, we hope that that service will result in a change in behavior, but maybe the service doesn't last long enough or the behavior change happens, you know, long after you've ended services and you don't have a way to follow up with participants to, you know, ask them <laughs> did that did they change that behavior. So the, at that point, the change in behavior might be hypothetical. And so then you kind of look back in the results chain to then think about, okay, so where, what change could be measurable within the time frame that you're delivering the services or within the time frame that you are interacting with participants. And so sometimes a change in awareness or change in knowledge might be the most realistic thing um, that can be measured or change in attitude, like someone's readiness to do something or their intent um, to do something. And Liz asked um, if we could share a results chain with the boxes filled in with a sample or example topic. <laughs> Sorry, Liz, we didn't uh, get a chance to do that for today's training, but we will do that for, for Thursdays. Um, so we'll try to do our best to maybe talk one through. <clears throat> and um, I could probably try to talk one through knowing of thinking of a program that I'm familiar with in terms of a parenting program. Um, Nicole, do you have anything that comes to mind that you want yeah, to talk through? Sure. I could talk through um, any any kind of public health um, health education example would work here. So let's say um, if you're working on something like like diabetes, which is a chronic disease, or, or tobacco use, um, which is a risk factor for many chronic diseases, and you're trying to work upstream to get people to have healthier behaviors, that has to start with something um, much earlier than the, the actual behavior change. So if you've ever tried to change a behavior, particularly an addictive one, it's it takes a lot of effort and um, there are many models for how to do that, but basically you, the first thing that has to happen is an awareness that there's an opportunity to change the behavior and then gradually to see some of the benefits of that behavior change. So whether it's somebody um, learning about, um, or sometimes it's not just learning that something is, is worth changing, like information about the damage that tobacco does to our bodies is pretty ubiquitous. And the issue is whatever is going on psycholog psychologically in terms of denying that that applies to you. You know, maybe people tell themselves, my grandmother smoked all her life and got into her 90s. Maybe I have a genetic predisposition to be protected from tobacco. There are all kinds of things that people tell themselves that we all tell ourselves um, that may be a barrier to awareness and knowledge. So, so the first things that have to happen are kind of breaking through that and finding examples or ways to, um, to talk to people about that, that behavior in a way that they can relate to it. So you're, you might build not just awareness, but knowledge of the relevance to you, to the person whose behavior or the group whose behavior 
you're hoping to change, then maybe there are attitudes and beliefs about that that are pervasive in a particular age group or location. You know, this isn't harmful or um, this, if this were harmful, we wouldn't have this offered um, in all of our stores and restaurants or wh whatever the attitude or belief system is that perpetuates that, that um, lack of awareness or knowledge. Um, that's another piece that you might wanna work on for, some, for a health behavior. And then um, it's really important to have a skill to change. So, you know, to, to what are the, um, the ways that something like motivational interviewing might coach somebody to start small with a behavior change, to expect relapse and learn from it, to um, have particular cues like staying away from the people you used to drink with for a little while or not going to a bar where you're automatically going to pick up a cigarette. Um, th those kinds of um, the, the tools that somebody could use to um, have a healthier diet, to, um, to be more physically active, to avoid triggers to an addictive behavior. Those are, those are specific skills that people can learn and can work on and, and gradually incorporate into their daily life. And as that happens, as those skills are used and reinforced and strengthened, then gradually a behavior can change. Even a really entrenched addictive behavior can change. And that ultimately leads to some of the, the changes in status that we, that we seek for a healthier population, for healthier outcomes. And of course, behind each of those examples are some of the structural and systemic things. It's not just what individuals believe and do. There are policies that, that put people in the path of different kinds of health risks that make it easier or harder to um, to engage in different behaviors that make the healthy choice the easier choice or the harder choice. So those are really important to take into account too as you're thinking about how to change awareness, knowledge, attitudes, and skills that lead to different behaviors and status. So those are just some thoughts that come to mind on the health side. Do you wanna walk Thank through you. one, Nicole, for parenting? Yeah, I'll do a quick one. Thanks, Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about a parenting program that I work with, Triple P, some of the things that we um, either hope or believe are happening in terms of changes that occur throughout the program are starting with awareness, just an, an increase in awareness of the importance of positive parenting and the impact that has on children's health and development. The increase in knowledge then would be around um, particular parenting strategies that are taught in the program. We actually do measure changes in confidence level, uh, their own confidence in their role and their skills as a parent. So that would be considered a type of attitude or belief. And then the actual skills is <clears throat> um, measuring or, or tracking the use of particular parenting strategies that leads to then cha hopefully changes in behaviors in terms of how parents handle parenting challenges that hopefully they can self-regulate, that they are remaining calm, uh, as well as changes in children's behaviors in terms of how they respond to um, uh, limits or changes or emotional distress. So there are also um, uh, child behaviors that can be uh, tracked as well. And then some of the status uh, like health status, mental health status, things that we can measure or track or, or changes in like the parents' reported level of depression, anxiety, or stress. And, and that's actually one of the most powerful outcomes that we see through the parent, this parenting program that just by learning and getting some skills and being able to build their confidence that that can uh, have significant impacts on um, the parent, parents' own emotional well-being decreases their stress and anxiety. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. That's that's a great chain um, and an encouraging one. But I also wanted to say that similar to theories of change and logic models, when you do this, sometimes you change your ideas about what's important um, to try to what's what's a, a point of intervention. And so, for example, with um, reproductive health work, teen pregnancy prevention, 
there, you know, years ago, there was the idea that if only people knew how to get contraceptives or how to access a clinic, then we would affect teen pregnancy rates. And doing a lot of work on logic models and these kinds of results chains led to a better understanding of actually it was attitudes and beliefs about your entire life goals. And some of the skills were about being able to negotiate relationship behaviors that were much broader than just whether or not somebody was having unprotected sex. So these are the, the changes in these result chains really um, change the kind, the nature and scope of interventions. So be open to a different result chain than what you think is going on. Uh, maybe, maybe you've got it locked in and well understood, which is great, but just be open to some, some other interpretations of how these things interact together. So let's see, would anyone like to come off of mute or share in the chat one or two of the outcomes that you developed during this brief exercise and love to see some of the examples that you came up with. Anyone brave enough to share? Okay, well, we encourage you to keep trying to share your draft outcomes with others. Sometimes the uh, learning also comes from having someone else that is not deeply involved in your program to take a look at it. And then sometimes the questions that others ask, like, what does this mean? Or how would you measure that? Can be the things that can really help you test out and flush, and flush out your outcomes. Liz, I see your I see your back and I see your hand up. Do you want to come off of mute? Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, one of the outcomes that we talk a lot about at the Boys and Girls Club, um, that's that's kind of a broad one, but also, you know, really is something that we measure is the percent of youth who are on track to graduate from high school. Um, and we try and articulate how participation at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and through our various programs helps keep kids on track. And then we would say that's as measured by our National Youth Outcomes Initiative, which is an annual survey that we administer to all the youth who participate um, in our programming at the clubs. That's fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that, for being brave enough to share that out loud. Um, and you know, it's, it was great just hearing that in that brief description that you shared, like what the actual outcome is, it's very clear and understandable, you know, that you have an existing tool in place um, to measure that. And then you also shared some of the um, kind of rationale and the importance of that. So thanks for that. Anybody else like to share? Stacey, uh, I see you posted in the chat. Do you want to come off of mute to read yours or do you want me to read it out loud for you? I mean, I, I can come off mute. <laughs> so uh, I'm struggling with output versus outcome. Um, so this is my current draft that doesn't end. By the end of 2022, the project will recruit at least 10 Shoreline students who are representative of the school's demographics along race, gender, and economic status for the Live Oak Youth Partnerships Youth Circle. Students will gain knowledge on leadership and communication skills in order to identify the after-school recreation and enrichment opportunities that best meet the needs of their peers. Knowledge gain will be measured by, and then we haven't had that conversation, um, but I heard the, the suggestion of including as measured by, um, so I'd love feedback. The, the, intent, the, um, the intent of this, my outcome number two, is around increased access and participation in stress, stress busting activities. So having the kids determine what activities should be offered in order to have social connections and physical activity opportunities to alleviate stress. That's where we're going with this, but this would be outcome one. Does anyone, because um, we like to make this also a peer learning and peer coaching kind of um, 
opportunity as well. Does anyone have initial thoughts or feedback for Stacy about her draft outcome here, particularly the question about is an output or outcome? I feel like you have some good stuff in here, Stacy. Like I feel like I can, I can pick, I could pick out the outcome that's in there. Um, just one thing that I uh, that I find helpful for myself whenever I'm trying to, in that same kind of quandary, like, okay, is this an output or is an outcome? Um, if you're talking about like the number of people that you're trying to reach, and you're describing who you know who that group is, um, and the kind of result of the activity, that sounds more to me like an output. So the recruiting at least 10 shoreline students, that would be kind of the result of the activity. So the output, and then the outcome is what do you hope will happen? What change do you hope will happen as a result of doing whatever it is you're doing with the students? So whether it's some kind of a class or curriculum or program or stress buster activities, like what do you hope will change for the students as a result of them participating in that? But that would be, your outcome. And it seems like the language you have there in the middle about students will gain knowledge on leadership and communication skills. Uh, it seems like somewhere in there is your outcome. And so then the next question would be like, um, do you have kind of ideas or ballpark estimates about what percentage students do you anticipate will demonstrate an increase in knowledge or um, depending on what tool you're using to measure that knowledge, um, like are you doing like a pre and a post and can you measure the actual percent increase in change from pre to post? Um, so those are just kind of some follow-up questions you might want to think through some more with your grant writing team. Nicole, anything you want to add to that? No, just I just want to reinforce that distinction of when you're, you're counting something like the number of participants or people who attended some, a training or something, that's something you point to, right, um, as you know, it, and it's necessary in order to make, make the other changes, but it's not sufficient just because people showed up or enrolled in something doesn't mean that anything actually changed. And so when you're when you are using language about change, that's in that's indicative that you're into the outcomes zone. Right. So hopefully that was helpful, Stacy. Um, and we're gonna move on. But I would say if anybody else has questions like that, you want to post your draft outcome in the chat and we'll see if uh, towards the end, if there's more time for feedback or other questions, we can circle back to those as well. But the last thing I wanna cover in this segment is then how, again, circling back to how to apply an equity lens as you're defining and evaluating your outcomes. So again, ideally you would have been asking yourself these questions as you're developing your theory of change and logic model and drafting your outcomes. Um, but it's also always helpful to, after you draft them, to just go back and do kind of that equity check. Um, is it, you know, is it clear through the process of your theory of change and logic model and, and outcomes what inequities you're seeing, and are the and are the outcomes really speaking to or make it clear um, how how you're working towards closing those gaps? Um, is it clear through your theory of change logic model? And so again, the things that you create in your theory of change and logic model, it's not all gonna end up in your outcome statements. That would just make your outcome statements too hard to, <laughs> to read and decipher. But there may be pieces of this, right? That uh, you take from your theory of change and you turn it into a response about, in this case, in the core application, you have to describe the community need or describe the issue that you're um, going to be addressing. Like that would be where you would be another opportunity to describe the inequities, what policy systems or environments influence those gaps. But also to be thinking about who's defining your outcomes. So obviously we're doing this as an exercise here in this training. Um, hopefully there are opportunities or you might wanna think about um, who else might need to weigh in on or 
give feedback on your draft outcomes? Like, do they actually resonate with, do they actually feel meaningful to participants or people that you would be working with or delivering the services to or engaging in your efforts? Um, and then asking what data are missing and what would improving equity look like? And can you, is that something that, that could be measurable? So those are again, um, questions that we think are questions to keep asking over and over and over that, that there may never be a complete answer or a final answer, but this is part of like building that equity muscle to make a habit of asking these questions. And so how are we doing this time here? We wanted to actually give everyone a chance to talk with each other, talk with one other person in breakouts. We'll do it in pairs. So you're just talking with one other person. Um, and Giselle is gonna post those equity questions that I just reviewed in the chat. And so we're gonna have you just spend about six minutes in breakouts talking with another person about what thoughts come to mind, insights, reflections, as you think about your outcomes and these types of questions uh, related to applying an equity lens. So we'll just be really brief. I'm gonna just randomly assign you um, Okay, and then we'll come back. We'll see the countdown clock start after you've been in your breakout rooms for five minutes and then have one minute to wrap up and then everybody will automatically be sent back here. Welcome back everyone. Hopefully not too many of you got cut off mid sentence <laughs> as you were being transported through cyberspace. Um, so we'll, we'll, we're about to take a break, but before we before we do that, would anyone, does anyone um, have an insight or an aha or reflection to share from your brief pair share there or about any of the things we've covered so far about developing your outcomes? Yeah, Liz. Yeah, I, I was paired with Ricky from Girls Inc. And we just talked about how um, Nicole, the one of the last questions that you mentioned really resonated with both of us, which is do our outcomes resonate or feel meaningful to our participants? And we were both reflecting that um, in youth service organizations, we can often assume that we know what is best for our youth, but especially as kids get older um, into kind of middle school and high school, inviting their input about what they care about, um, it becomes so much more essential and inviting them to help design um, outcomes of what, uh, you know, their participation can and should be helping move them towards um, is really important it's not to not skip over that. Uh, thanks for sharing that insight. And so great that the two of you were, ended up in the same room and that resonated with both of you. And, you know, I think it's true of not just youth serving organizations. I think it's probably all of our organizations and programs, right, that we kind of assume we know what's best or what's gonna be meaningful. Uh, and sometimes, you know, sometimes we're right. Sometimes it, it may be on, on target and part of doing that program planning and evaluation with an equity lens is involving and including and, and co-designing with um, your participants. Yeah. Anyone else wanna share an insight or a question that's emerged through the training so far? Okay, we're gonna to return to some of the um, equity-centered evaluation ideas that we started out with and try and get into another layer of detail about them and also have some time, some additional time for your questions. So here we go. So for each of these elements of, of any evaluation, equity focused or otherwise, um, we're going to go into a little more depth and see how we might shift the kinds of questions we ask, the methods we use, the teams we convene, and how we make sense of all of it. So we'd like to suggest just uh, as you listen along with these shifts that I'm going to describe, you might want to just have a sheet of paper or a Google Doc or a Post-it note or whatever is handy near you and maybe on the just divide it in half and on one side put the kinds of things you're already 
thinking about for your evaluation. And then on the other side, the kinds of things that might involve a shift in these kinds of directions. And, and we totally recognize that many of you are already doing these things and there are probably some great local examples that we'd love to feature at a future training. But just for those of you who might not have been doing this kind of um, work in this way, just want to think about where those shifts are. If you've already done those shifts, we'd love to hear about them when we get through this next set of slides. So let's dive in. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the shifts is in the kinds of questions the, in, the evaluation as a whole will be asking. So the kinds of outcomes that are being tracked and as the exercise that Nicole Young just led us through and thinking very carefully about those outcomes, who defines them, what, what kinds of um, equity dimensions are behind them. And then just a, a very raw question about who benefits the most and the least from the program that we're thinking about evaluating, being very deliberate about asking that question. Are there unintended consequences that might exacerbate some inequities that are in place? So this is, again, some of the, the questions that Beth started us out with. What, what are the unintended effects of, of trying to concentrate on a particular population or a neighborhood or an intervention that while we don't intend to cause burden um, and, and exacerbate inequities might have that effect. So being cautious about that. What are the policies and systems and environments that influence what we're trying to do? And this is a, a really um, important aspect of equity focused evaluations because it's one that really has gotten uh, less attention in a lot of evaluations historically. And then just imagining what um, improving equity and the drivers of equity would actually look like? What, what is it that we could envision for a more equitable um, set of outcomes? So these are all adapted from uh, a publication from APT Associates called Embedding an Equity Focus in Evaluation. And after I get through these, we'll put a link um, in the chat to show you how to get to some of these resources if you want to read more about them. So it's time for a little more evaluation humor. And um, we often have questions about which methods are appropriate for an evaluation, qualitative, quantitative. And as this cartoon says, consider all of them. So you might find a role for different kinds of methods. Um, we have some tools that we can share that might particularly be helpful. But for starters, you'd wanna be looking at the kinds of instruments. So what kinds of questionnaires, or surveys or observation checklists? What are we actually using to track what we wanna learn and, and the insights we have about outcomes? But when we do that, we really wanna ask hard questions about who was involved in developing and testing them. So if it's someone who is devi devising a questionnaire, but the language is a little off, if there's slang, for example, with um, teenagers or adolescents who are or answering questions about their behaviors. Um, if there are things that, that don't quite fit with the way um, a person who is in a program would describe their situation, their mood, their behavior, their hopes, their dreams, um, there are so many different ways to go wrong with instruments. And one of the ways to really go right is to in involve um, the people who would actually be answering them um, in designing and testing them. And part of that quest is to really think about whose voices are heard and not heard in that process. And then if, if we have um, some gaps in that, which is almost inevitable, um, what are we doing to make sure that we do have those voices incorporated? So are we doing certain kinds of outreach, some extra effort to recruit people, to make them comfortable with participating in what we're doing? Um, are, are we doing what we need to do to go the extra mile to get that input? And then often we have um, in evaluation circles a, um, a, a tilt towards quantitative statistical data and numbers, sometimes at the expense of more qualitative types of things like stories. So making sure that, um, that if, if it's appropriate for your program, and what you're evaluating, that you make space for, for both kinds of data, 
as appropriate and have the opportunities to, um, to get stories about people's experiences alongside anything that might be more quantitative. As we've noted earlier, when you're trying to uh, have people answer surveys or interview questions, it's always a burden. It's at least a burden of time. It's often a burden of effort and it can be a burden of difficulty. Um, some of the questions that we want answers to raise tough feelings or um, might, might ask people to recall something that's emotionally difficult for them. And so we need to be really careful about who that burden falls on and then what, um, what we're doing to make that easier for them. And then finally, not forgetting about the system indicators. So what's, what's behind some of the specific um, outcomes that we might be interested in evaluating. And then when we're looking at the teams that we've convened, internal, external, some combination of them, we wanna make sure that there are different perspectives represented on our evaluation team. And if there are perspectives that are missing, maybe there's a, a missing component of a, a cultural dimension, of lived experience, of age, of geography. Um, if those are missing, what steps can we take to include more perspectives and backgrounds? And it doesn't mean that those perspectives need to be an official part of the evaluation team for the whole effort, but, but just some way to reach out and incorporate those perspectives early, especially in the design of all of these things. And then another place where we often fall short in an equity dimension is how we're analyzing and interpreting our data to make sense of it. So we've got these instruments, we've got um, some answers, we've got some responses, and then we're trying to understand them. What, so what are our findings? What data do we have? What data are missing? Why are there gaps in our data? How are we using our data, especially to analyze the systems level changes that might be behind something? And how do we integrate all these different types of data that we that we work so hard to incorporate? So what are the, the stories alongside the numbers, the numbers that illustrate the stories? And how do we plan to use and share all of this information that we've gathered? So again, these are from that same resource, um, Embedding an Equity Focus in Evaluation. It has a lot of great thought behind it and is pretty recent as well. And some of the resources that we've mentioned throughout today involve um, that equitable evaluation initiative that we started with. There's um, another resource about um, models of how equity can and does impact evaluation that has a lot of examples from actual evaluators and evaluations that might be helpful. This, um, the brief resource embedding and equity focus in evaluation has a lot of great ideas and you'll, you'll, they'll be familiar to you if you've been listening into um, these shifts that we've described. And then the Strive Together guide that's here on the right of this slide, a guide to racial and ethnic equity systems indicators is really, really helpful. I, I learned a lot from reading it and it has a lot of great examples um, of how to look, how to, how to add that systems dimension to whatever you're evaluating. So that was a very quick tour of some shifts in each of the dimensions of, of evaluation that at least um, might be worth thinking about as we move forward. Um, it's not necessarily the case that, that every one of those aspects of an evaluation will be missing an, an equity dimension or lens, but it's just a good um, exercise, as Nicole Young mentioned, for the outcomes to have a, a checklist in mind of where are we missing that perspective and how can we incorporate it? So I hope that gives you some ideas as you're thinking about evaluation, not just for your core RFPs, but in general. And Gisela's put those links to the resources in the chat, make it a little easier to get to them. But while we're together, do you have questions for us about any of either those pieces or other elements that we've talked about. And I'm gonna just put myself on mute for a second and see what's being destroyed behind me by this puppy. I'm sorry. We have a former bath mat. Too bad, so sad. 
Okay, questions for me or the puppy? Has, has anyone um, already gone through some of these shifts in some of the evaluation work that you've been doing for your programs or prior programs? Would you have examples to share about trying to incorporate some different voices in designing your instruments or getting feedback from different groups that you're working with? And sometimes we hear, especially close to Silicon Valley, a lot about human-centered design, and that's kind of the same principle of trying to incorporate the perspectives of people who are actually using something or participating in something in the design of that thing. We had envisioned a lot more questions. So we are in danger of ending very early. Dina, go ahead. You wanna unmute yourself? Can you hear me and see me? Yes, both. Okay, I'm wondering if I could back up to the last section and ask the question. Something, something that I'm, is that okay? Yeah, go for it. So something that I'm thinking about, and as we go through the examples of outcomes, I'm, I, I, all the outcomes I hear examples of are primary prevention outcomes. And so I'm wondering if you could just walk us through a secondary prevention um, uh, um, results chain and outcomes. Because I think that that's really kind of my, my disconnect is that while the outcome, for example, while the outcome is to um, ultimately, I don't even want to say this because it's going to be wrong. So I'm, I'm working on developing new workflows and changing the behavior of, of providers to expand and increase our integrated behavioral health in order to have the outcomes on the desired population. So. It, it, it's just not, I guess that when I'm walking through it, it's just not as sexy as, as you know, seeing direct change of attitudes and beliefs in the primary population that you're wanting to change the outcomes, but we're working with um, internal workflows and processes that need to change in order to impact that population. Right, so in that example, um, the, the the sexy outcomes for the population aren't going to happen unless there's access to that, um, the results of that integrated workflow. And so again, same kind of question I posed to Beth, what, what are some of the things that are getting in the way of that, um, that encounter where, um, let's, I'm just, just guessing, Dina, so, so um, there's very little space in the clinic schedule and yet you wanna take advantage of the opportunity when someone is already there to, and, and a consult is indicated for a behavioral health issue to do an immediate referral, right? Some kind of integrated, and maybe, maybe even walk that person across the hall so the, the right. provider is familiar to them. It's not a whole scary other thing, another building, another new person. Exactly. So it's, the, you know, it's um, destigmatizing, demystifying, that, that additional layer of help mm -hmm. and, and really increasing access to it. And that, that sounds great to me. I, I mean, I'm just speculating about what integrated, an integrated model would look like. And so if, um, if the, is that a correct assumption yeah. about what you're trying to do? Yeah, yeah, that was, okay. that was a perfect synopsis. Mm -hmm. Okay, Slightly and so I might put to it, but exactly the same thing. Yes. Okay, and so what? Um, why is that not happening? That somebody gets walked across the hall to the the behavioral health provider and has access to that consult in the moment where they most need it and, and could benefit from it. I think in part there's a there's a um, old dog new tricks phenomena going on, right? Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm where, and, and there's a, a shift in the medical model, right? I think mm -hmm. providers have that, I got this, 
Yeah. Right. So it's shifting the thinking from I have got this to we've got this. And this is your area of expertise. And this is where mine stops. And I'm going to pass it off. So really create reducing those barriers between physical health and, and behavioral health and making it a more a, a smoother transition and really boosting the work of the team, which is really what team-based care is about, mm -hmm. which is which is what we what we do, how we operate. So um, it sounds to me like there are some ways to talk about a knowledge change, mm -hmm. an awareness change, an attitude and beliefs change, a skill, mm -hmm. a behavior, and a status yeah. change. Yeah. And so for all of you, you know, this is a specific example that's clinical. But if you're putting yourselves in the eyes or the body or the situation of the person who is changing, that can really help you walk through. Like, you know, when, when Nicole Young mentioned about a parenting education example for the results change, she talked about changes for the parent and changes for the child mm -hmm. behavior. So you've mm -hmm. got changes for different kinds of clinicians, you've got changes for a team, and you've got changes for patients. And so each of those has, um, has and multiple, change. yeah, multiple populations of patients too, because yes. I'm thinking yes. of youth, I'm thinking of pregnant women, I'm thinking of, you know, people who, who historically don't, don't access behavioral health. Right. And you've got the societal stigma around yes. behavioral health that's more intense in some groups than others, but is just pervasive across populations. Right. So um, I hope that gives you some clues about how to walk through the elements of the results chain through different eyes mm -hmm. that will help you see that sequence. What, mm -hmm. what needs to change first, next, then after that, right. um, in order to get to that desired state that you're that you're hoping for mm -hmm. and and that might be different answers for different people um, and there might be some individuals who are more resistant to um, those shifts in knowledge and awareness and so forth right. and maybe that's where some peer influence comes in or other incentives I don't know but um, yes. it's just sometimes useful to just um, walk through that process of what needs to change as much as you can from the perspective of the person who's changing. And it's an opportunity along the lines we just discussed of instead of guessing what those are, let's ask them. Right. Let's see where they say the stumbling blocks are because we may be right about our assumptions, but we also may learn some things that are useful, like who, what's the last time somebody changed their practice in a comparable way and what made that happen. Um, so, um, and then because you mentioned workflows, Dina, um, you know, that's a level of a system change. It's, it's a system within the clinic, but it's also reflective of the healthcare system and the pressure it puts in terms of billing and short time with patients and all those things, scheduling. So what are the, in addition to the individual providers and the changes that they might make in shifting their practice, what are the system um, levers, for lack of a better word, that could either encourage or discourage those changes? Not all of which will be in your control or influence, but acknowledging them and thinking about where they are most pain painful. Thank Does you. That's help? very helpful. Very helpful, Nicole. Thank you. You're welcome. And then um, because of your particular clinic and patient population, you know, there, there are equity dimensions to each of those things we've just talked about. The interaction between providers and patients, the support that patients do or don't have for accessing this care, the follow-up, Are 
Are there other questions that some of you have? I'm seeing one in the chat. It came, again, it came through as a direct message. Um, is increased access an outcome? That's probably a good one to talk through. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends, I think, on what that access, how tightly that access leads to a change. So working quickly and off the cuff with Gina's example, if somebody comes to the clinic, that's a type of access. They can get an appointment, they have transportation, they show up. But once they're there, if they have an encounter with a provider that's less satisfactory or they have a long wait or they're treated disrespectfully or they're confused about what they're learning or being told, then, um, then that access is not in and of itself leading to a change. And it might in fact be disappointing or counterproductive. So I, I would say that it's, the question really is access to what? Is it access to just physically being in a space and, a, and access to a service or is it access to the quality of the service and the type of interaction that leads to the change that you're trying to achieve? Or is increasing access a function of I can call my provider and get an appointment this week versus I call my provider and I can't get an appointment for three months? Absolutely. So that's, you know, I think during COVID when there were a lot of shifts to telehealth, a lot of providers saw differences in things like no-show rates because it was easier for some people who had formerly experienced transportation and childcare challenges to get to an appointment to do that virtually. That's not across the board, and there are all kinds of other issues with that. But um, but thinking about access in terms of what is the the barrier to access, how is the access barrier overcome, and what happens to the, um, the desired behavior or status change as a result of the access, I think would be some questions to ask about whether or not that falls into an outcome category. There are other questions or dog obedience recommendations. <laughs> I think a lot of these kinds of things that we're asking about um, or talking about in terms of the outcomes and the evaluation questions um, are, are not obvious and that's why they're difficult and that's why they really benefit from talking through with, with colleagues, with participants in your programs um, and similar to the kinds of things Nicole Young started with, with the um, logic model and theory of change, it, it can really be um, instructive to just test our assumptions about all of these things because those other perspectives can really let us know when we've made an assumption that may or may not be valid and um, good things can happen when we, we open up those, those questions. But it does take time. It does take some persistence and prodding and processing. So we're, we're under no illusions that these are quick fixes, but we're just trying to streamline the kinds of things you might ask and the, and the ways that you might organize what you get out of them. One thing I would add to is, you know, with these trainings, um, Nicole and I really believe that these kinds of tools are useful and applicable in all kinds of situations, um, for all kinds of, you know, grant opportunities, funding opportunities, just program planning in general, even if you're not requesting funding. Um, and so a lot of what, everything we've talked about today, say applicable, you know, many different situations. And then when you're thinking about how to use this in your core applications, I think the one thing I would say is just remember that 
because I think it says it in a couple different places in the RFP that the core funding is really intended for direct services. Uh, the targeted impact grant is the one that does more explicitly say that they're expecting some kind of collective impact approach that does involve you know, systems level work, capacity building work. Um, and so if you are uh, proposing programs or projects that are, are focused um, heavily or more on kind of the systems level changes or organizational changes. Um, I would say just make sure that then in other places in your proposal, you're making it really clear how that is part of being able to deliver the direct services, um, how that benefits, how that addresses, you know, the, the need or, or issue that you identified, how it how those changes are necessary in order to address the inequities uh, that you've identified. Um, as you are describing your services or your, or your project proposal, um, again, that's another place to, to draw that connection. And then as you're thinking about your outcomes, you might want to do, I think like what Nicole is suggesting to Dina, like do a results chain for, you know, the, you know, the internal <laughs> workflows and the, and the providers, right? And then do a results chain for the patients, right? Because ultimately they're the ones that are benefiting from or experiencing the changes, the, the impact of the changes that happen organizationally, because then you might, um, because with you know the core applications that are depending on what tier or level you're applying for, right? You can propose more than one outcome. You might decide to have, you know, one that's really clear, clearly related to a direct service outcome, you know, the, the uh, people who are directly benefiting from or participating in whatever you're proposing. And then you might also have one that is more systems oriented. Um, and if you've explained that connection, right, in other places in your application, then by the time a reviewer sees the outcomes, it's clear how they're connected. Um, otherwise, you know, someone might see a proposal and see outcomes that are where it's not really clear, or it's hard to see like where the direct services come in. <laughs> or where the direct you know, participants or beneficiaries are, are in there. So you just don't, you wanna make it as easy as possible for the reviewers to understand your train of thought and the logic. Beth, I see your hand up. Do you wanna ask or add something? Ask, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so what you're saying really brings me back to my question about my uh, second proposal, which is essentially public education activities. So you know, what we're hoping to impact is kind of system-wide or county-wide changes in how people eat. Um, and of course that would be on a, you know, we would certainly be speaking to individuals or inviting individuals to our events and things like that. Um, it, so yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to do a, a less than abstract, <clears throat> less than abstract understanding what you just said about how to make that a, uh, um, a direct services approach when we're not really, we'll ch we'll, we can measure changes in attitude and intention to change behaviors and things like that. But beyond that, what we're looking for is more of a systems change. So how do we, how do we get that direct services? I mean, maybe it's not a fit for the core RFP um, or maybe it is. So your thoughts. And who, and Beth, I know we have our one-on-one -on -one scheduled next week, so we can also explore this in more detail then. Um, who is the intended audience for the educational sessions? And, and who is it that, and are those the same people that would be making the systems changes? Um, it's more, when I looked at, um, when I looked at the, um, the website with the from the data share that you sh that you shared um what what makes the most sense to me um is the um i'm sorry i'm pulling a blank um the where it was talking about building public will i think it's more along the lines of building public will because the change that needs to happen system-wide for instance with policies um 
and at, inst at institutional levels that uh, building public will is an important part of that change. Um, so the, and this is where it's also tricky because the, you know, who are targeting for the change, the, you know, we really, we need everybody to change. You know, this is a global problem. It's not just a Santa Cruz County problem, it's a global problem. And it's, um, people are more familiar with the, um, the problem of fossil fuels than they are with dietary contributions to environmental collapse. But if you just think, if you, if you just think about, you know, like if you're trying to do um, a public education campaign about, you know, for instance, not idling your car while you're sitting at a um, parked or whatever, like the target who you're, the person you're trying to change the behavior of isn't necessarily the person who's having the worst impact from the emissions, but they're the person who's creating the problem. So it's these kinds of, and maybe it is, maybe it's not of interest to enough people. I think if anybody else is doing, um, thinking about public education or public awareness campaigns, what I'm asking about might be applicable. Otherwise, I'm happy to take it up with you privately, Nicole, in our appointment. Um, I think it would, I think it'll definitely be good to talk through it some more in your one-on-one. -on -one. Um, partly because I think it'd be um, probably a good idea to, to, to think through some more like, um, and I don't know if you've already done some of these steps, Beth, but like that building that theory of change. I mean, I know that it sounds like you have some, you know, some clear rationale, some, you know, probably data to draw on to, to explain why this is important. And I think the key is going to be like, how are you going to be able to articulate um, the, how that problem shows up in our community? Right, and who's most affected by it, and how will a public uh, education campaign um, how would that end up kind of helping mitigate or address the the, the gaps or the inequities that you're identifying? So it's it's possible that you have all that, right? That that you that you have all those pieces. Um, I think with things like public education campaigns that unless there's just, unless there's like some really clear direct um, kind of theory and logic kind of showing like how that directly benefits particular groups of people or areas of our community that might be a harder sell just for this particular funding source. Um, Thanks. Yeah, that's kind of the big, biggest question in my yeah. mind as I look at this and go kind of further down this direction, like this might not be the best match for this funding stream. So, um, or it might, it might work. So, um, right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Nicole, were there other questions in the chat that there were um, a couple RFP specific ones um, that I, I entered the RFP um, Q&A document email address. So I just wanna remind everyone, if you do have questions that are specific to the RFP, and in this case, it was from, from Gina about, um, they don't collect income data on participants and yet it's required and there isn't an, an NA option in the reviewer, uh, um, portal. And so that's that's an excellent question for HSD. And I can see how that would be frustrating and difficult um, that there's no extra option there. But all questions, there's one more round of the Q&A that's going to be um, shared with everybody. And you have to submit your questions by Monday, January 17th, which is Martin Luther King Day. So some people might not be working that day. So just be aware of that. Um, either the later this week or over the weekend or on Monday, after that point, they won't be including responses to those questions in that global Q&A doc. And I also put a link in there to that, the last document in case people haven't seen it. Um, you can 
um, just see what's been answered prior to now, and they've been um, highlighting the new responses. So in case you saw a previous one, and, and it's pretty well organized. It's by, by different kinds of segments of the RFP and different kinds of questions. So if you have a particular question, it might be um, easier to just look at that document first and see if that question's already been answered. But if you do have new questions specifically about the RFP, um, the, the um, portal, the types of questions, the language um, or clarifications really encourage you to submit a question. It's very likely others would have it as well. And then Dina, you had a question about the number of outcomes that, um, that also differs by the tier of the RFP. So for example, in the medium tier, they're asking for up to three. That doesn't mean you have to have three, but, um, and then enlarge up to five outcomes. And then there's, there are questions before and after that that you, you'll see that, that give you some opportunities to elaborate a little bit. Um, and the outcomes are for the first year. So um, it's, it's um, if we think about our results chain, it's very possible that outcomes would be different in the second or third years of this three-year grant. And you do have an opportunity to describe what those, how those are different. But the, the drop-down uh, outcomes answers are for the first year. I, I know it's a lot to track, which is why we're having these conversations and um, trying to meet with as many of you as possible one-on-one. -on -one. And, and um, I know it's a question you probably want answered right away instead of waiting for the responses next week, but I just encourage you to do that. Are there other questions for us, either about today's content or other questions it raises? Well, we do have some other things to tell you about. So let me at least pull those up and just keep, if you do have other questions, feel free to raise your hand or, or pop them into the chat. So um, tomorrow at two o'clock, there will be um, a, a training about using that reviewer portal. That's the online portal for submitting your application. So if you missed the first round of that, in December, this is a chance to participate in that. Um, there's also next week um, a, um, I'm sorry, not next week, this week. On Thursday, we're going to repeat this same training. So if you have colleagues who missed it um, or don't particularly want to watch the video or whatever, or want to see a version without um, household goods being destroyed in the background, um, you could watch on Thursday instead. That's in the afternoon though, from one to four. And then we are holding um, group office hours on Friday morning from nine to 10 and 10.30 to 11.30. And then we will have um, a training offered twice in the same day about using data and stories for this kind of work for continuous learning and improvement. So it's an extension of some of the things we talked about today, but with a particular focus on the, the ways that that data and stories can be presented to, um, to, to describe what you're doing. And then there will be another round of group office hours on January 19th from eight to nine and 9.30 to 10.30 and also on the 26th from one to two and 2.30 to 3.30. So we know that's getting close to the finish line for the RFP, but if you do have still have questions at that point and don't mind sharing them in a group setting, that would be a time to do that. And, you can also keep signing up for one-on-one -on -one sessions if that would be helpful and appropriate for you. So we always have a feedback survey for you um, for all of our trainings. So we use this information to keep going. And especially since we're doing this again, we particularly value those of you who attended the first version of something to let us know um, what worked and, and uh, we will always pay attention to this and, and put it to use. So in this case, immediate use. So please do fill out the feedback survey before you go on your way. 
And thank you for hanging in there. And we know this is a lot, a lot, a lot of information that people are um, trying to sift through and absorb, and especially in the context of trying to prepare, um, in many cases, multiple applications. So we really appreciate that you hang in there and have questions for us and for each other and share your examples. It really helps uh, all of us, I think, learn how these things can be put into practice. So hang in there. Good luck to everyone. And thank you for being with us this morning.